this morning, I have a message for you about a new beginning, a new beginning. We're coming into the Christmas season, a picture of a new beginning. We've got at least three ladies in our congregation that I know of that are expecting babies. There's going to be some new beginnings. Are there others that I don't know about? We have no news to share with you. <laughs> a new beginning. In golf, T-Bone would tell us they refer to it as a mulligan. And I can tell you from my experience in doing some golf challenges, if there's one thing you can sell a lot of, it's mulligans. If you could sell chances for a new beginning in life, you could sell a lot of mulligans to people. There'd be many numbers of days where we might choose to say, hey, I think I'll take a mulligan today. Can I rewind this and go back and start in bed again and hear the alarm go off again and start all over? There would be many seasons in life where we might get halfway into something and say, hey, you know what? I think I'll take a mulligan on this. How many of us in high school or college would have liked to have taken a mulligan, got a week or two into the semester and said, you know, it just didn't work out quite like I thought I would like for it to have. I'll take a mulligan. I'll go back to the beginning of the school year, back to the beginning of the semester. I'll start all over. I will actually read the book this time. I'll prepare for the test this time. How many of you started a job that you were very eager to start and participated in for a little while and then got in over your head? and said, man, I'd like to take a mulligan. Can I rewind a new beginning? Sometimes in relationships, people get there. I'd like a mulligan. I'd like to start over a new beginning. Scripture is full of new beginnings. For the children of Israel, there were any number of times that they got a new beginning. When we come to the New Testament, the story is all told of a new beginning. This morning in the text, we hear about Jesus Christ, and he's going to be telling his disciples about his death and how it's going to bring a new beginning, and they're scratching their heads and wondering, how could that ever be? Then he begins to tell them that they themselves can experience a new beginning, and they're wondering even more, how can I have a new beginning? Some of you this morning are ready for a new beginning. You'd like a do-over, a fresh start, a mulligan. And the great thing about our God is He's always ready to grant people the opportunity to have a new beginning. The frustrating part, and you're going to hear Jesus say it over and over and over again in this text in John chapter 16, is it comes in a little while, in a little while, in a little while. Those words can be encouraging. You can know that something's coming. Or they can be frustrating because it's not very definite. How long is a little while? For me, a little while is about five minutes. For you, a little while might be three days. For some people, it might be a week or two or a month or maybe even a year. In God's, in God's timing, it might be 30 years or 40 years, a little while. For our God, who has an endless amount of time, and time is really not an issue for, he can say a little while, and he means it, but he doesn't feel it the same way we feel it. We hear a little while, and we want it right now. You follow along as I begin reading in John chapter 16, verse 16, and hear Jesus repeatedly say, in a little while, and hear what it is he has to say about a new beginning. A little while, and you will no longer behold me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples, therefore, said to one another, what is this thing he is telling us? A little while, and you will not behold me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. And so they were saying, what is this that he says to us? A little while. We do not know what he's talking about. Verse 19, Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said, a little while and you will not behold me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more for 
the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one takes away your joy from you. Let's pray together, please. Father, help us to hear what it is that you have to say to us this morning about a new beginning. There are some men and women, boys and girls in the room today, who need a fresh start with you. Some have never come to salvation and today need to put their faith and trust in you for salvation. Many others have trusted you for forgiveness and salvation and yet have allowed sin to encumber their lives and today need a fresh start. They need to repent of those sins, confessing them to you, and receive the forgiveness that only you can, can offer and provide. Lord, some are looking for a fresh start in their marriage or a fresh start in their relationship with their children or their parents. Some are looking for a fresh start at school or in their career. Lord, all kinds of ways that people need a new beginning. Thank you for being the God of new beginnings. We trust you. We believe you. We rest in you. And Father, this morning, we give you our undivided attention. We're asking that you'd help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You've heard his voice this morning in Scripture. He's said it in a little while. God, when are you going to do X? The big question of your life. When are you going to restore the broken relationship with my children or with my parents or the conflict that exists in our home or in our workplace? God, when are you going to do this thing? His answer, in a little while. He is at work, and he is doing the things that only he can do. You can't do them. The best meaning friend or family member that you have can't deliver what our God can deliver. He's at work, and he is doing it, and he is doing it on his own timetable. And his answer to you, like it was to his disciples before, is in a little while. In just a little bit, I will show you these things. In just a little while, I will answer your question. In just a little bit, it will all make perfect sense. In a little while. What does he say? Beginning out in this text, he says, in a little while, you will not behold me. In a little while, imagine to these disciples, him saying these words, in a little while, you're going to see me no more. You won't behold me. You won't hear my voice. You won't feel my embrace. You won't receive my teaching. In a little while, you won't behold me. When for day after day, week after week, month after month, that's turned into years, they've been with him uninterrupted in their fellowship, uninterrupted in his provision, uninterrupted in his teaching. He's always been there. And so they've grown very dependent upon his presence. You and I have grown very dependent upon the presence of God in our lives. Imagine hearing for a little while, in a little while, you won't behold me anymore. What does all this mean? The thought of being alone, all alone, without the Savior, without the Master Teacher, without the King of Kings, without the Lord of Lords, it was terribly distracting to these disciples. You mean for a season we're going to be without you? We're going to be totally isolated? The one that we've left everything for and forsaken everything for is going to be leaving us a little while, and you will no longer behold me. And their minds start churning, and their imaginations start to wonder, and they start to feel this great sense of distraction that leads them to a point of becoming very discouraged. Was it worth it? Was it worth it to leave our fishing nets? Was it worth it to leave our tax practice? Was it worth it to leave our friends, our family? Was it worth it to be ridiculed by our communities? Has it been worth it to be spat upon? Has it been worth it to be chased out of town? Has it been worth it? It would have been worth it if you would have stayed with us forever, if you would have continued to perform these great miracles, teach these great teachings, if you would have continued to be present with us all of the time, holding our hands and guiding us through, but you're telling us, in a little while, we will behold you no more. They became so discouraged. It was devastating. They were rocked at the core of their existence, shaken to the core of their being, and perhaps you've been there 
where you felt alone and isolated. But Jesus, those are important words, but Jesus always responds. And Jesus responds in this text. Jesus knows what they're thinking. They don't audibleize their question to Jesus, but Jesus perceives their question. Are you wondering about these things? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus, it says in verse 19, knew that they wished to question him, and so he began to speak. You have the freedom this morning to pray any prayer that you want to pray, to ask God any question that you want to ask. But sometimes we become intimidated by the fact that he is almighty and all-knowing God. Sometimes perhaps we're even a little bit embarrassed or ashamed to acknowledge I've got a question about what God is doing. We think, well, I shouldn't question God. I shouldn't doubt God. I shouldn't fear God. We may not even have the courage to audibleize the question. The disciples here in this text didn't have the courage to audibleize the question, but Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and so they said to him, Jesus perceived their questions, and Jesus perceives our questions. Jesus gave an answer to them, and Jesus will give an answer to you. And not only does Jesus know the questions and have the answers, but he participates in the solution. Jesus is always a part of the answer. He doesn't just give the answer. He is the embodiment of the answer. So you have questions, doubts, fears, concerns. Let me tell you, Jesus knows. He perceives that question, doubt, fear, and concern. And he's going to answer your question, your doubt, your fear, and your concern. And the reality is he's going to participate in that answer. He's not going to just say, well, here's what you should do, or here's what you could do, or here are some options. He's going to say, I am your answer. I am the one that you're looking to. I am the one that will provide the solution that will give you the reassurance that you need in this moment. Jesus has always responded. In a little while, you will not behold me. Then the text goes on to say, in a little while, there will be a new birth. A new birth. I'm in the unfortunate generation that gets included in the birthing room. Some of you missed out on that. It is a miracle, and it is a sight to behold, and the wonder of all wonders is that anybody has a second child, or a third child, or a fourth child. That a woman is willing to go through that once, you could say, oops, that was an accident, I didn't know what I was getting into. That somebody voluntarily does it twice, three times, four times, it is something to behold. And Jesus draws on this for an illustration. He begins to make sense of life to us by pointing us to life itself. Verse 21, whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more for the joy that the child has been born into the world. Apparently, Noel forgot all about what she went through with cash. You didn't forget. You're just willing to go again because cash is so wonderful. It's something, what God is willing to do. Jesus is speaking here of the pain that will happen for him. And he's saying it's going to be worth it. Jesus knows that crucifixion is coming. He knows there will be no life if there is no death, that there will be no joy if there is no sorrow. And so Jesus points to this. He says, in a little while, there will be a new birth. In a while, you won't behold me. Why? Because he's going to the cross of Calvary. Why? Because he'll be laid in that borrowed tomb. But then he says, in a little while, there'll be a new birth. There'll be great joy that'll come from that sorrow. Things will begin to make sense to you that didn't make sense before. In a moment when the world is rejoicing, you'll be sorrowful. And then when the world is sorrowful, you'll be rejoicing. Jesus was illustrating his future. Jesus was giving information to those who were the closest, the nearest, the best to him, his friends. And Scripture says that you and I can call him, call him a friend. You're not left on the outside to wonder. 
He's not leaving you in the dark. He's not leaving you in confusion. He wants to share with you his plan, not only for your life, but for all time. Jesus was identifying his faith, his faith. This is what's going to happen. I will be crucified. I will be placed in the tomb. I'll be raised again, and there will be new life, and a new birth, and a new start, and a brand new beginning. Jesus' offer, let's consider it this morning, of a new birth. It's something that we grow to desire. I believe it's a work of the Holy Spirit. There's going to be pain. People need to understand there's going to be a pain that comes from the separation from the old life. And Jesus is making it clear. He's saying, you want new life? I'm going to make a way for new life to come. I'm going to sacrifice, lay down my life so that there can be a new beginning. You're going to have to follow the same way. If you want a new beginning, a new life, there's going to be a tearing apart, a separation from the old life. You can't bring the old life with you into the new life. And so it must happen. It's a desired labor. It's going to be worth the exchange. That's why Jesus gives the illustration of childbirth. It's going to be worth it, he's saying. It's going to be tedious. It's going to be laborious. It's going to be painful. But in the end, you're going to be so glad that you went through this because it's the only way for there to be the new birth. It's going to be difficult. Jesus never painted a picture of easy or cheap salvation. We need to be careful that we don't paint a picture of easy or cheap salvation. It cost him everything, absolutely everything. There was nothing left. He was totally crucified. All of the wrath of God poured out upon him, the pain that comes for a new beginning. For you and I to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's going to be a deliberate decision to say, I'm going to forsake the old ways, the old life, the old attitudes. I'm going to exchange this for what God has to give in the future, but it's going to be difficult. You need not think that it's going to be easy. You do need to know that he's going to help you all the way through. You won't be alone in it. So he will make a way and he will make it possible. The new birth means new opportunities. Things can happen now that couldn't happen before. There was no way for God to allow sinful man into the holy presence of heaven prior to Jesus Christ making the way. Jesus Christ made the way. This is a new opportunity. This is a new responsibility. You've got to lay down the old to receive the new. You've got to exchange the sorrow for joy. You've got to receive the gift of Jesus Christ. It means new life in a little while, in a little while. You can choose this morning to allow that to frustrate you or to encourage you. The same words will do different things for different people. For you to know that in a little while, Jesus is coming again. It's very encouraging. Or in a little while, he's coming again. You say, why hasn't he come already? It can be frustrating. In a little while, he's going to provide the answer, the peace, the assurance, the fulfillment of the story for your life. In a little while, he's at work. He's doing what only he can. In a little while, Scripture ends here this morning in verse 21 and 22. With this truth, in a little while, there will be a new beginning. There will be a brand new beginning. Therefore, verse 22, you too now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one takes your joy away from you. Let's talk about some benefits this morning of a new beginning. In the old life, the sinful life, the life lived in the flesh, you can have any number of things temporarily. Lost people, your lost friends and family members, your lost neighbors and your lost co-workers, they have some good days, don't they? It's not all bad. 
They have some happy moments, but those aren't lived for all eternity. They're temporary. They're fleeting. You can buy some good things. You can have some nice experiences. You can go to some relaxing places, but they're all temporary. They're all fleeting. Jesus is trying to provide for us a way here that's everlasting. A new beginning brings lasting joy is what he says in verse 22. Nobody will be able to take this away from you. The disciples would have all known that nobody lives forever. They had attended funerals. Their loved ones had died. Their friends had died. They had seen the cemeteries. They had visited those places. They knew cognitively this can't last forever. None of them were thinking that Jesus was going to die at 33, but they all knew he can't continue on like this forever. This must end at some point. Jesus is pointing to something that never ends, to a joy that never ends, to a life that never ends, to forgiveness that never ends, to salvation that never ends. A new beginning brings lasting joy, brings liberating freedom. You'll be unhitched from all of the sin and all of the shame that marks our earthly lives, a freedom that can be found in Him and in Him alone. In a little while, freedom is coming. In a little while, everlasting joy is coming. In a little while, life eternal. In a little while, a new beginning. So many benefits of a new beginning. And some marks of the new beginning are these. It's a gift. It's a gift. I said in the opening of the message this morning, if you could sell this, people would be lined up around the building to buy it. If you could sell new beginnings, if you could sell mulligans, if that were the Black Friday special, come in right now and get you one of these, people would pitch tents and spend the night to be first in line to start over. And Jesus says in this text to his disciples initially and now to you and I on this Sunday morning, I'm giving you the opportunity for a new beginning. It's a gift. You don't have to buy it. As a matter of fact, you cannot buy it. You cannot earn it. So so don't even try earning it. Don't even try to save up to buy it. I want to give it as a gift. The new beginning is a gift. That's hard to communicate to a world that is so consumer-minded, that is so self-value-oriented. But God has a gift. It's a mark of His new beginning. It's His grace. We sing about His grace. We talk about His grace. We pray and give thanks to about His grace. But grace is an action on behalf of our God to give us his unmerited favor. He wants to give his grace to us. It's a gracious act, a new beginning. It's the way God works. You've heard people say, ah, it's just a God thing. That's not a cop-out. That's not you and I being biblically illiterate. That's just where we come to on many things. It's just the way that God does. If you run into people that want to ask, how is it that God could forgive me? How is it that God could save me? It's a God thing. Our God is just a good, good God, a merciful and gracious God who has a gift for all mankind, a new beginning. You may need one this morning. You may need to start first this morning by receiving forgiveness and salvation. You've never known him as your personal Lord and Savior. And so I'd encourage you to do that. But you may be here and you've known him for months or years or decades, and you'd say, I need the new beginning. I need a fresh start. The good news is this. Jesus has already paid the price. He's already extended his hand by saying, here's the gift. Why would you not leave here this morning with a new beginning, a fresh start? If your marriage needs a reboot, your family life needs a reboot, your career needs a reboot, your student life, whatever it is, if it needs a fresh start, a new beginning, say, yes, Lord, right now, I want a new start. I need a new beginning. And he'll give it because of all these things that he said he would do in a little while. He said, in a little while, you won't see me anymore. That already came and went, right? 
And in a little while, you'll see me again. That already came and went, right? He, he was already buried. He was already in the tomb. He was already resurrected. He already made those 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. He's already ascended to the right hand of God. So these, in a little while, are past tense. Now, they already happened. And he's today saying, I want to give you this everlasting joy, this joy uninterrupted, this joy eternal that nobody can take from you, a new beginning. It's his invitation to you this morning. Why don't you receive it? Father in heaven, thank you for today, for the privilege of being together in your house. Father, you've spoken to our hearts this morning in Sunday school and in the songs, through the sermon. Lord, we pray that you would receive our faith, our trust, our obedience as a response to your invitation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, you respond, please, as the Lord leads.